Welcome to Reconnect, the podcast dedicated to sharing and defending the good news of Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus died for sins, was buried, and on the third day was raised again, according to the scriptures, for our salvation. It is through Jesus alone that we are reconnected into a right relationship with God. Reconnect us, O Lord. Hey everyone, this is Andy Rasman. Welcome to the first Christmas episode of Reconnect for 2016. I say first because there likely will be another Christmas episode after this one, maybe two. Uh, and I love Christmas. Uh, I see Christ in Christmas from start to finish. And I know that uh, many people don't. I know many people think there are a lot of commercial trappings, a lot of traditions, and a lot of practices that pull us away from Jesus in this time of the church in which we are looking back at when our Lord came here as a babe, took on flesh to be like us, so that he might later bear our sins and die for us. We look back at this time that he came, trusting that, okay, he promised he would come in this way. He said he's going to come back. He fulfilled the first promise of coming. He's going to fulfill the second promise. This is a time, too, to make us not just look back at his first coming, but to have us look forward to his second coming. And I know a lot of people, again, get so uh, torn away from this. Oh, gift-giving, gift-wrapping. Uh, sometimes just even having to meet up and see family can be difficult sometimes. Uh, maybe maybe you struggle to get along with family members. Maybe in-laws are a difficult thing. Uh, maybe even your challenge is just having that time to uh, get together where everyone can be on the same page schedule-wise. Or even the cost sometimes of traveling if you live out of state. Sometimes you wish, man, I wish I could just have this day off to just rest at my house. Uh, so there's all sorts of things that you're dealing with, that you're struggling with, that may be pulling you away from Jesus. And so this episode, I'm going to give you some pointers, I believe, to see Christ in your Christmas if you find yourself in that predicament. Also, be able to uh, see all the little, I guess what people would say, secular imagery of Christmas uh, and be able to tie that and connect that to Christ so that you can use this imagery and symbols of the Christmas season as conversation starters to share the gospel since that is what Reconnect is uh, geared to do. Uh, that is, help us share the gospel of Christ and defend the gospel of Christ. So uh, so for the first part of this episode, I'm going to read an article I wrote for uh, Life in His Hands, which is a Christian newspaper in the Inland Empire of California. Uh, I will hopefully have a link to that article on this episode. Uh, so this episode's called Seeing Christ in Your Christmas. If you go to andyrasman.com uh, and search Seeing Christ in Your Christmas, you will you will find, uh, hopefully, as long as Chris, the guy that runs this newspaper, still has the article online, uh, I'll, I'll have a link to it so you can see um, the way he presented this article there. All right, so I'm going to read this, and afterwards... I'll take a short break and have a student with me, John Campbell, who will uh, talk a little bit about why he loves Christmas and, and how when people talk about we shouldn't celebrate Christmas as Christians because it has pagan origins, uh, how he would respond to that. All right, so seeing Christ in Christmas, the article I wrote, there are many simple ways to see Christ in Christmas. One way to accomplish this goal is by drawing biblical parallels with the traditional Christmas the tree decor. As long as Christians are not glorifying pagan beliefs and practices or bowing at the altar of gluttonous consumerism through our American Christmas tree traditions, then there is freedom in Christ to take what has become a hallmark of the secular world at the time we celebrate the birth of our Lord and point it all back to Jesus being the reason for the season. With no plea to reject Black Friday shopping as the day to get your Christmas season started off on the right foot, and with no bah humbug, towards the secular spirit of Christmas, here's a list to check twice to see Christ this Christmas. The Christmas tree is an evergreen tree because it doesn't lose its needles through the winter. Using this type of tree points to the eternal life that Jesus Christ offers to the world. Jesus is the one who was and is and is to come. 
Revelation 4, 8. The Christmas tree also hearkens us back to the tree upon which Christ was slain, the tree by which eternal life has been given to the world. Galatians 3, 13. The traditional tree toppers, a bow, an angel, or a star, all point to the Christmas tree representing Jesus. Bows adorn gifts, and the coming of Christ into the world is a reminder that the Father gave Jesus as a gift out of his great love for us, John 3.16. At Jesus' birth, Luke records a great multitude of angels proclaiming the good news of his arrival to shepherds who watched over their flock at night, Luke 2, 8-18. Matthew tells of wise men traveling from the east, following a star to the birthplace of the awaited Messiah, Hebrew for Christ, Micah 5-2, and Matthew 2, 1-12. The wise men from the east who followed the star of Christ brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, valuable gifts that were common to give to a king. If the Christmas tree is seen to represent Christ, the gifts at the foot of the tree draw us back to the gifts the wise men laid before baby Jesus as they worshipped him. Matthew 2.11 Our gift giving at Christmas should serve to remind us that as we give to others, we are in need. We we are in, in need. Oh, wait, sorry. Our gift giving at Christmas should serve to remind us that as we give to others who are in need, we are giving to Jesus, Matthew 25, 34-40. And if the gifts at the tree are seen to have come from Santa Claus, an all-knowing, all-loving, apparently all-powerful, and never-dying father figure who cares for children, it should point us to the true gift giver, God our Heavenly Father, James 1, 17. The lights that are held up by being draped across the Christmas tree's branches are a final touch that point back to Christians, the church. John begins his gospel biography of Christ by saying that in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of man, John 1, 4. The light of Jesus shines in the darkness of this sin-cursed world, John 1, 5. The light of Jesus enlightens men as to who God is, John 1, 9. Later in his gospel, John directly quotes Jesus as having said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life, John 8, 12. As Christians know the Lord through Jesus and possess eternal life in the light of Christ, we become just what Jesus calls us in his Sermon on the Mount, the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. When we look at the Christmas tree, we are reminded that Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. The light of the world has revealed himself, lighting the path to eternal life. As Christians are connected to Christ, we shine the light of Christ into a fallen world. The church that is spread out of, out across the world and is still growing shines as many dispersed beacons of hope in a fallen and depraved world. Jesus came, died for our sins, rose for our salvation, and is patiently waiting for more to come to know of his love and grace. This Christmas, remember that Jesus came once with angels and with the star as the ultimate gift of God to this world, and Jesus will come again, this time with the entire heavenly host with the falling of all the stars as he returns for his chosen and holy people. Let's help the world see Christ this December as we hold out the good news of Jesus Christ in all that we say and in all that we do in our Christmas celebration. All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully you got some cool ideas of just how you can see Christ. Uh, When you look at a Christmas tree, uh, I really do see that and I'm reminded of all that he's done for me through um, through the Christmas tree and the way that it's decorated. I think it's, it's a great teaching tool for us to teach our children um, the Christmas narrative of Christ's birth. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a break here, but before I do, I just want to remind you that I do have a website, contradictmovement.org, if you are doing any last-minute Christmas shopping to pull you back into that consumeristic sort of mentality. Uh, I... I, I know a good bit of people that have bought my book, Contradict the Can't All Be True, uh, as Christmas gifts for people. Uh, so feel free to um, do that if you go to contradictmovement.org. Uh, if you do it, you know, probably by December 10th or 15th or so, uh, I can get an email to you, ask you who it should be signed to, write a little message to that person, and ship it priority, which is two to three days shipping, uh, and, and you'll easily have it for Christmas. Uh, there's also stickers and tracks available there. Um, uh, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while and you'd like to financially support what I'm doing here, 
uh, those are certainly ways to do that by buying some of the products that I have. So it's not just a simple donation, uh, but it would be you getting something in return. All right, uh, we'll be back with John Campbell. He's going to share um, his thoughts on Christmas and why Christians should really be able to worship Christ uh, in the Christmas season through whatever is typically associated with being like of the secular Christmas mindset uh, freely knowing that you know it does help bring hope uh, to a dying world. The following is an excerpt from the Gospel Coalition's review of Andy Rasman's book, Contradict, They Can't All Be True. Quote, Contradict will help a lot of conversations get started. Rasman provides Christian believers with a great starting point for understanding and evaluating many of the world's religions. He should be commended for writing a substantive apologetic book that's also practical on so many levels. The strongest sections are where he offers a concise guide on interacting with skeptics and other religious adherents. Many readers will find Rasmund's section on the 20 facts on the five major world religions and 20 questions that are most commonly asked when sharing the contradict message invaluable. This is a solid book, apologetically, theologically, and practically. I pray it will open the eyes of many believers to the importance of evangelizing in a pluralistic age, unquote. To financially support Reconnect, visit ContradictMovement.org and order your copy of Contradict, They Can't All Be True. Contradict stickers and tracks are also available. Again, that's ContradictMovement.org. All right, as I said at the opening of this episode... Uh, the second segment, I have John Campbell with me, one of my students, a senior at Cream Lutheran High School. I thought John would be great for this episode, as I indicated, because I saw that he was passionate about Christmas and thought it was a wonderful thing that Christians should celebrate. Uh, this came up in class. John, do you remember when this came up in class? Um, I can't say I quite remember the exact day, but uh, I remember getting pretty heated talking about uh, the different ties to uh paganism that a lot of people believe Christianity has, especially around the Christmas season. All right, John, so um, that's great. Uh, I think I remember it came up when we were talking about Jewish festivals. Yeah, that was it. Uh, because one of the festivals, Hanukkah, is typically close in time to Christmas, mm -hmm. and I had heard a Christian pastor that has a radio show mentioned that he thinks Christians should celebrate Hanukkah uh, because Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, and Hanukkah is known as the Festival of Lights, and at Christmas time we're remembering how the light of the world Christ came into this darkened world. So he's saying this is more of a Christmas thing, and it's biblical. Uh, and that's when you really spoke up and got pretty passionate about how I don't believe in that. I think that, you know, we should celebrate Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I thought I'd play for you um, what this pastor said and mm -hmm. get some of your feedback and thoughts on it and, and how you would respond. Uh, this pastor's name is David Hawking, H-O-C-K-I-N-G. I found him at a thrift store. I have no idea how old this CD thing is I have, but it was a 10-pack CD says he has been teaching the Bible over 45 years, has pastored churches in Ohio and California, taught on the college and graduate school levels, uh, and that he's the radio Bible teacher on the nationwide broadcast Hope for Today and has authored over 30 books and numerous booklets. So this guy's pretty prolific, it seems, in his life, although I haven't heard from him besides finding this pack of CDs. Uh, his website's davidhawking.org if you want to check it out. All right, so I'm going to play this, and John, I'd love to hear your feedback. After. What's the next question? You well, this is uh, this is one I've heard uh, often of late. Uh, is the Christmas tree a pagan symbol, and are we <laughs> oh. somehow making a grave mistake by putting one in our home? Well, we've got a number of letters on this mm. one. Well, let me read the passage, uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. It says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, 
Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Hmm. Now you see, when uh, the average Christian reads that, they say, wow, God's condemning the Christmas tree. Well, not exactly. Hmm. Um, although I think there is something to say here, let me just begin by saying the context is dealing with uh, pagan shrines to gods. It is not really talking about our Christmas tree. But then on the other hand, the history behind our pagan tree and its ornamentation, um, it's not good, folks. And you say, you called it a pagan tree. Well, it is. It comes out of pagan practice. And uh, I'm not against it. It's a non-moral item in one sense. A tree is a tree. And just like God says, uh, don't be afraid of it. It can't do any evil and it can't do any good. And a lot of people say, well, it does us a lot of good. It puts us in the spirit of Christmas. Excuse me, you're talking Mm -hmm. the wrong spirit there. What puts us in the spirit of Christmas is our recognition of who Jesus Christ is. Amen. So this is a part of the problem here in Jeremiah 10. It's not really talking about a Christmas tree, but there is... Uh, there, there's some indirect application here. I don't think we need anything that uh, we adore or admire or whatever that substitutes for our Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Again, why not put a manger scene there and tell the whole story of Christmas? It'd be a better way to go, in my opinion. Well, what would you think about a uh, six-foot, by maybe a 12-foot nativity scene and then a maybe a two-foot tree? Absolutely. That might be better. Uh, well, <laughs> or just get rid of the tree. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, a lot of our people are building those major scenes for Christmas holidays, and mm. it's just a tremendous way to witness to the saving grace of our Lord. Absolutely. You know, you cannot remove the name Christ. All right, I'll cut it off there. Uh, John, uh, what are your... What are your, what, what's your commentary there? Well, um, I find it very interesting how the first thing he does is he cites this verse and then instantly kind of goes against the very verse he was using. He says, oh, well, they have this verse. What was it again? It was Ezekiel. Um, it's Jeremiah 10. Uh, Jeremiah 10. Uh, 2 through about 5, I yeah. think is what he read. He talks about how they uh, chop down a tree and adorn it with silver and gold and he goes a, he goes on to say that that is a representation of of pagan idols and false idols um and then he goes on to kind of answer his own question he says oh well this isn't really talking about the christmas tree but um we do see the history of the christmas tree coming from paganism but what's interesting is if you you can do a a quick google search and find that he's not the only person that thinks this there's plenty of stuff online talking about how the Christmas tree derives from paganism, and the pagans were the first ones to do this. But with a very similar Google search, you can find the actual history of the Christmas tree. And I have an article here from um, from whychristmas.com mentioning how uh, it wasn't just the pagans that began this tradition, and it wasn't hanging trees in their houses. Um, the tradition that the pagans has is they would use they would use branches of evergreens to decorate their homes, uh, and it would make them think of the springtime to come. And at the same era, the the Romans were using fir trees to decorate their temples during their festivals of the winter time. And uh, at the same time, Christians used it as a sign of everlasting life with God. And nobody is actually really sure when fir trees were first used as Christmas trees. Uh, probably beginning sometime around a thousand years ago in Europe, but you can't exactly say, you know, just because pagans used a similar tradition and Romans used a similar tradition that were copying an idea that was originally brought by pagans. What if it is uh, brought by pagans? Would that then be something we should not do? I mean, he clearly called it a pagan tree. If it is of pagan origins, how would you respond to that? Well, I mean, if it is, let's suppose. if if you were to say that the Christmas tree was pagan, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a problem having a Christmas tree. I think there's representations you can find 
you know, with the Christmas tree, like the star on top, the star on top being uh, a representation of the, the, you know, the North Star that guided the three wise men to baby Jesus. And so um, I think if you were to be able to prove that the Christmas tree was paganism, which I don't really think it is, then yeah, um, just like he said himself, there's not necessarily any harm in having it in your house. It can do no good. It can do no evil is what he said himself. So that's if it is a pagan tradition. So obviously, if it is a pagan tradition having a Christmas tree in your house, we can see that there's no harm in, you know, a custom area of having a tree inside your house. Well, let, let me hear some of the good then, because, I mean, I think when I was kind of indicating that some Christians have a problem with Christmas mm -hmm. in class and they advocate we should celebrate Hanukkah, I wasn't saying we shouldn't celebrate Christmas and do the traditions we normally do. I was suggesting maybe we actually add and incorporate Hanukkah into our calendar well, as well. And, I think, and you instantly um, jumped up. So I want to know what you think is yeah, the positive. Well, I think the big problem is is there's two sides to Christmas. There's the spiritual side and the cultural side. And I was listening to a, a sermon from Mariner's Church on um, Pastor Kenton, and they have a really good message talking about the difference between spiritual and cultural Christmas. And I think when people... Uh, bring up all these subjects talking about all oh, the Christmas trees, paganism, so we shouldn't celebrate Christmas, or this with Christmas has to do with paganism, or it's evil or symbolic. I think they're focusing way too much on the cultural side of Christmas, and they're looking for reasons for the cultural side of Christmas to be wrong, but they fail to realize that it's the spiritual side of Christmas and the one true symbol of Jesus Christ, the, you know, the birth from a virgin, which is the one symbol that God gave us, you know, I think they don't focus enough on the fact that we need to consider the spiritual side of Christmas. They're focusing way too much. Oh, well, this, this tradition could possibly be paganism. So we should, we should uh, abolish Christmas and the Christianity all in all and switch to Hanukkah. I think that's outrageous because they're totally forgetting about the entire spiritual side of things. Um, what were some of the um, applications from that service that was given in terms of how we should focus on the positive or the proper spiritual side of Christmas well, in relationship to that secular yeah. cultural side? Well, um, did he give any on that? Yeah, he did give a couple examples. You know, there are a lot of movies. Oh, there was this one movie I was thinking of. You ever, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to... Oh, It's a Wonderful Life. Do you remember yeah. that movie? It's a yeah, Wonderful Life. amazing. He sacrifices his dreams of travel to be with the people he loves. And he sacrifices something so big and so important to his life because he was a good father making a big sacrifice. That sounds a lot like God making his big sacrifice of yeah. his son coming to earth and dying for our sins. And I think that's just one good example of some of the good ties we can see between yeah. spiritual and cultural Christmas. Let me riff on that movie just a little bit, because um, I think that's a movie that is well accepted by all people, not mm -hmm. just Christians, um, just as being a very good movie yeah. and in terms of how it's made, the acting, the storyline, the way it all pieces together. Yeah. Obviously, there's some bad theology in there, mm -hmm. um, well, but I mean, it's Hollywood. What should we expect? I mean, angels getting their wings when they do certain things. Well, like, they did their best. Okay, so I mean, there's there's the problems, but I think kind of what you said, how people in some of these ancient cultures would bring in these evergreen elements from trees into their home to remind them of the coming spring. I mean, they're mm -hmm. in a time where, I mean, they... They don't have easy electricity to turn on a heater. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably even harder to get clothing that's warm for them. So, I mean, this was probably a difficult time just to survive, to have food, mm -hmm. um, to keep fire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a challenge. And so you could almost relate that to adorning Christmas lights on your house. Right. Yeah. And do you, you can easily see a representation with Christmas lights being the light of God, mm -hmm. you know, in our world. And that's what I've seen floating around is yeah. Christmas lights being a representation of the light of the world, which is Christmas. Well, what, what I, yeah, I, I like that example there. Um, well, I was thinking with like this movie, It's a Wonderful Life. It really is a depressing, sad mm -hmm. downer of a movie for almost its entire duration. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing good is happening but to this guy. That is the world. But that is the world. That is the world. And that's the situation we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And at the very last moment of the movie, like literally a minute before the credits roll, light comes in. 
yeah. he thought every single thing was done. He thought it was over, and he finds out that uh, essentially everyone that he's been sacrificing for recognizes what he's done, and there is now hope. They save him from his situation, and they all sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, hmm. right? Glory be to us for the newborn king, right? I mean, it ends with the proclamation of the gospel in yeah. this Hollywood secular movie. And I think almost every Christmas movie that that's watched um, again and again every year is like that. Charlie's Brown mm-hmm. Christmas, it's horrible. Nothing is good happening in the show until the very end when Linus drops his blanket and proclaims the gospel. And that's the perfect thing that I think you find a really good representation and connection between spiritual and cultural Christmas is that's the classic Christmas movies. Everything is going wrong. None of the family's showing up. You've seen a, a million Christmas movies like that where it all turns out amazing in the end, and that is a perfect representation of the world and how they were waiting for so long for a sign, you know? There was a battle going on, a civil war, and um, between people who were still holding on to God and those who weren't, and, you know, what God would say is, you know, you have to hold on. You have to wait for a sign. You have to ask for a sign. You know, in Matthew one twenty two to 23, oh, sorry, no, Isaiah seven ten to 11, you know, God spoke to Ahaz. And this time he said, ask for a sign from your God. Ask anything. Be extravagant. Ask for the moon. And uh, that was the sign he gave them. He said, in time there would be, uh, you know, a son born of a virgin. And um, I think that uh, these Christmas movies are the perfect representation of all this time where they spend, where the world is just in peril, everything is going wrong, but at the last minute we have the light of the world that comes to save us. Yeah, really good news. And what were you going to share from Matthew? Were you going to quote the um, angels talking to the shepherds? Well, no, have, that's that's that that's in Luke. Yes, so this must be the Luke. sign of the Magi. I have uh, Matthew one twenty two to twenty three. It says, "All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet." that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Nice. And that was actually the one message that uh, Pastor Kenton of Mariner's Church stressed, is God with us. That is the one thing we celebrate in the Christmas season, is God with us. Mm-hmm. It's the very coming of Christ. And, and you know what? I mean, some people are going to say, uh, you know, well, that's every day God is with us. But you know what? I think we are... Um, I, I think we suffer from what I like to call spiritual amnesia. Mm-hmm. You know, like how many of us can actually remember the church sermon message we heard last week or the week before or mm-hmm. the week before that or the, what you heard in the last Bible study? And it's like we we easily forget, which is why we have to continually be together in Bible study, continually read God's Word. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's nice that... Um, we have this church calendar that flows through yeah. and stresses certain teachings that are found in God's Word. And, you know, come come March, you maybe forgot that important message of God is with you. But yeah. because it's actually on our calendar and we have all these traditions and practices built in, mm-hmm. it, it's as if God has um, helped us, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think, in a way, you could say these cultural sides to Christmas are a huge help to remembering this holiday and remembering this amazing thing that is Christ's birth. And I like to think of it as you see all these traditions, you know, everyone gets annoyed. You see uh, buildings and structures and companies putting up Christmas lights and Christmas decorations months and months before anywhere near Christmas, you know. I think Walmart had their Christmas tree up in July, you know. It's insane. But it's the ultimate reminder of what is to come. And I think people don't even realize what they're celebrating. Mm-hmm. And in a way you think, oh, well, you know, they're, they're making a mockery of Christmas. But what I believe is I think that this holiday is so extraordinary and the birth of Jesus is so extraordinary that you don't even have to believe to proclaim it, you know? I think that people are blindly putting up Christmas trees, even if they don't believe in it. They put Christmas trees and uh, they put presents under the tree. They put up lights. I think... Personally, that his word is just so amazing and yeah. that this story is just so amazing yeah. that even the blind and even the yeah. unbelievers celebrate the tradition. Hey, that's that, that's great. People pointing to and knowing the truth without realizing it exactly. or subconsciously doing it. And that's something we've talked about on this podcast a good bit, John, is a distinction between general revelation and special revelation or natural knowledge and direct revelation or direct no- or um, special knowledge or mm-hmm. revealed knowledge, um, which I know you know. Do you mind riffing on that real quick? 
Do you remember that from Doctrine? When you're from your junior um, year? I, I didn't have you in that class. but You didn't have me. Mr. Bearford touched on that quite a bit, the yeah. difference between – you know, the actual knowledge revealed to us. And, and Mr. Barefoot's West, by the way, who's on this podcast a good bit for listeners, just mm-hmm. so you know. Go ahead. So um, Mr. Barefoot touches a lot on uh, the difference between revealed knowledge and, you know, uh, what is it, um, knowledge that we already have. A general knowledge general or knowledge, natural yeah, knowledge natural or knowledge. general revelation. And yeah. you could almost consider Christmas and the birth of Jesus general knowledge. Because it's everywhere, and we have these so-called pagan traditions to thank for that, to thank for the idea that, you know, something, you know, everything in the Bible is revealed knowledge, you know, that is the knowledge that has been given to us, and it was in the Bible that, um, you know, Jesus came, and he was born, and he died for us, and that was revealed knowledge, yeah. but now, because of these pagan traditions, because of the Christmas tree, yeah. and because of all the celebration that happens because of this extraordinary holiday, mm-hmm. you could almost consider it common knowledge. Everyone yeah. knows about Christmas. Yeah. Um, and from that, this common knowledge, general knowledge, none of that is enough to save us, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think what you're saying is, as our neighbors put lights up, as our neighbors put trees up, and all this does have a connection to Christ and its symbols. That's what I actually shared in the first segment mm-hmm. when you weren't here when I recorded that was all these connections. And I think as us as Christians, then we do have special revelation. Mm-hmm. We do have that direct revealed knowledge from the Lord and scripture. As yeah. you said, it's a reminder for us. We can mm-hmm. tie this in. We can reveal to them what they already know. Yeah. It, but, it, but, but what they know unconsciously and have suppressed or exchanged for mm-hmm. a lie, we can show them the the oh, truth course. behind what they're really doing. And that's what's amazing about this is, you know, obviously salvation is not our job. You know, that's the Lord's work. But what is our job? It's our job to spread his word to mm. all four corners of the world. And I think Christmas does a wonderful job of spreading God's word throughout the whole world. You know, people see Christmas trees and Christmas lights. They think, oh, where does this come from? Why do we put up Christmas trees? Why do we put up Christmas lights? And that is a perfect opportunity to preach the word, if you ask me. You know. Yeah. Um, what if someone is listening and they still are in the, you know, this is pagan camp. I struggle with this. Anything you would give to them if they haven't already seen how it's okay or they have the freedom in well, Christ to, to worship or to I think partake in such things? The, the biggest thing that um, websites and this guy talking do is they cite uh, Old Testament, mainly Old Testament uh, scripture about um, false idols Hmm. and how, you know, there's this one, let me see, it's uh, it's, uh, Deuteronomy 12, talks about uh, uh, Deuteronomy 12, 1 to 4, uh, Deuteronomy 2 says, Yah shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon high mountains, upon the hills, and under every green tree. And that's an example of uh, a verse I've seen used to call the Christmas tree a pagan practice or a false idol. Mm-hmm. But um, this is what you have to understand is this is coming – most of these verses are coming out of the Old Testament where they're talking about false idols. And this is all um, a certain kind of law. It's all uh, – what is it? There's the three types of law. Um, ceremonial, ceremonial law. law. Well, I think this would be moral law personally because we're still not supposed to have idols today. Mm-hmm. But um, keep going on what you're going to say. Well, I was uh, touching on the idea that a lot of this does fall under the ceremonial law where, you know, we're not supposed to, you know, even have these kind of idols around us. But, you know, nowadays we don't see them as idols. A Christian doesn't put a a Christmas tree in his house and say, this is an idol that I have in my house. He thinks of it as more of a symbol, you know, and obviously... It's talked about plenty of times. We don't need yeah. symbols, you know. Okay, people I, have little crosses and stuff. They don't necessarily need them, but if it helps them pray, then that's okay for them. Yeah. So I think if you're struggling with the idea that your Christmas tree might be paganism, I would try and look more on the spiritual side of things. Focus more on the idea that the Christmas tree can be seen less as a pagan symbol and more as maybe even a symbol of evangelism or yeah. spreading of the gospel because people see this Christmas tree and they see this tradition and you don't think of it as paganism until you actually look into that and do mm-hmm. the research. The first thing you think of when you see the Christmas tree is Christmas. You think of Absolutely. Christ being born. You think of Christ. Yeah. So I think what would be safer for you if you're having 
if you're struggling with this, is you need to see the Christmas tree as the ultimate symbol of Christmas, you know? Even if it was a pagan symbol in the past, now it's been converted to this wonderful symbol of the birth of Christ. John, that is awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Um, I'm really inspired by you hearing that. Uh, hopefully listeners, this, this guy's a senior in high school, uh, saying such things. It's good to hear the youth of our church uh, being so bold to be able to speak about Christ. Uh, I'm encouraged just by that, John. Um, I think I misunderstood initially where you were going with the three types. Um, so I would say moral law, mm-hmm. having an idol certainly still applies oh, today. Don't have that. But you were yeah, saying, yeah. you were you were looking at those verses that say, Israel, yes, have no idols among you, mm-hmm. um, which would probably be like a civil law, I would assume. Yeah. Ceremonial laws are more like the sacrificial laws and the cleanliness laws mm-hmm. and the festivals. Um, and, but as a nation, yeah. you're not allowed to have any of this stuff. Yeah. And that I was nation touching doesn't more exist, on the but, idea that, you know, Jesus did fulfill ceremonial yeah. laws. And in the same way, you can think Jesus fulfilled the Christmas tree. Right. Yeah. I, I'd love it. Great connection of that. Um, as you were speaking, I, I was reminded of, in terms of that, taking the Christmas tree and proclaiming Christ through it as mm-hmm. a symbol or a starting yeah. point for evangelism. Um, a guy I'm, uh, friends with, Jake Wells, um, he was on episode 31 of this podcast talking about tattooing and flying drones for Jesus. Um, talk about other things people may say is pagan, right? He's, he's, he lives in that world. Um, probably not the flying drones, but, um, the tattooing part. Uh, a Facebook post he had, his, his daughter, um, is named Hallow. It, it's Hallow Snow, uh, Hallow Snow's birthday, which means it's tree day. Um, yeah. this was, he posted this November 30th. So I don't know if this is tradition he has every November 30th on her birthday. They put up the Christmas tree, but he says for Christmas and he has all caps C H R I S T Christ mass Christmas mm-hmm. for Christmas exclamation mark. Don't forget why you have a tree in your house. And on Facebook, he put Galatians 313, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he was hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing, for it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. <laughs> wow, right? That's pretty powerful. Pretty, pretty powerful. And I love how, you know, he puts this on Facebook. He's taking yeah. an opportunity um, and puts a picture of their Christmas tree with the with two of his kids in the photo. Mm-hmm. Uh, John, any any closing words you want to share with this, um, this Christmas season? Um, you know, I would like to uh, touch really quick on the idea of declaring these symbols or things like the Christmas tree as pagan. I think declaring them pagan and telling other Christians they're doing something wrong is probably even worse than putting a Christmas tree in your home. I think that um, you could almost call that leading them astray, Mm -hmm. you know? Why would you see something like a Christmas tree, and if that's being celebrated as a symbol for Jesus Christ, why would you want to, you know, not necessarily twist, but give the separate idea that it could be for paganism? Not saying that it it, uh, never was, but my, you know, thoughts on this are just, if you see somebody using the Christmas tree as a wonderful symbol of Jesus Christ, then I think that's amazing. You mm-hmm. shouldn't take that away from them. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, thanks for being a guest on Reconnect uh, this 2016 Christmas season. Uh, with what John was just saying, I think he's he's touching on legalism in the church, taking mm-hmm. things which are not directly forbidden in Scripture and making it something forbidden for Christians, mm-hmm. which is completely um, harmful for Christians because they may want to partake in it, and you just now made something a sin, which is not a sin. But who knows? Mm-hmm. Maybe for you, this could be a sin. If your conscience actually tells you that this is pagan, I shouldn't partake. Mm-hmm. Then you don't have to. Then you don't have to. But don't force what you think is mm-hmm. unclean to be unclean for everyone else if it's not in Scripture mm-hmm. forbidden or commanded one way or the other. Y'all, mm-hmm. you got more to chime in? Yeah, okay. I was just thinking, if you see it as sin, then you don't have to have it in your house. But you should never, ever lead anyone else to believe that it, it should be sin, you know? I think you do what you think is right to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And many people see the Christmas tree as a wonderful symbol mm-hmm. of the birth of Jesus Christ, yeah. and that's fine. Jesus, 
God saves. Emmanuel, God with us. This is what we get to remember this Christmas season. Uh, and remember that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Uh, and that freedom comes through his life, his death, mm-hmm. and his resurrection. Uh, and the message of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, which begins here at the Christmas season as he took on flesh, became human so he could bear our sins, is the good news. And that is the message that reconnects us into a right relationship with the Lord. Merry Christmas today. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, share this episode on all of your social media sites and with your email contacts, people who will benefit from listening to the show. Thank you for listening. Reconnect us, O Lord.